Today we're going to be learning Ketuba Daf Tzadivav. This is the Daf for first day of Sukkot. We're going to start at the Mishnah at the bottom, at the beginning of the chapter, Tzadihei Amudbet at the bottom. Almana nizonim nichsei itomim. The Almana gets supported by the funds of the orphans. Masei adeha shalahem. And her masei adeha go to them. Just like with the husband. He pays for her food. In exchange, she gives her salary to him. Same thing with the orphans. They do not need to bury them. Your Shah, your Sheikh Tubata, the ones who inherit her Tuba, which is her Benin her male children, they're the ones who have to, meaning not all the Yorshim of the husband, which could include other wives. No, just the ones who are going to inherit her Tuba when she dies. So now the Gemara asks, when it says Nizonet, a woman who is the uh, almana, okay, there's two ways to read it. It's very hard to translate. I'll read it this way. Almana nizonim in me means an almana gets supported and fed by the orphan's money. Oh, honey zone, it's not. Or is it a woman who gets supported by the, right, a widow who gets supported by the funds of the orphans, then ma'ase Then they get her the proceeds, right, her salary. What's the relevance? Well, you might remember on Daf Mem, no, Nun Bet, I'm a Bet, it was a, or not a Machloket, but different customs. Of the Galil in the, up in the north, they said there's no way the Yatomim, they don't have a choice, they don't have an out, they have to support her. Meaning, right, as long as she doesn't demand her Ketuba, they give her food. Once she demands her Ketuba, that's the end of it. But until such point, she determines when that point is. Odilma, and then it would be every almana gets supported by the orphans. And also her masayadaim go to them. Odilma hanizonet not ukanche yuda. Bibai lo yavula. Or do we say hanizonet? And it's like anche yuda. A woman who gets supported by the orphans, as opposed to a woman who the orphans say, we're not supporting you, and they can decide that according to Anshay Yudah, and basically say, take your big tuba lump sum money and be done with us. So if she happens to be getting supported by them, then she gives them the salary. If not, they decide to get your tuba money and be done with us, then she doesn't give them the salary. So Tashma, let's learn from here, starting now at the top of our daf. So he said in the name of Shmuel that Mitziat um, if she finds a lost item, she gets to keep it. So what can we learn from here? If we say only a woman who gets supported, meaning not all women have to get supported by the orphans, which means they don't exactly function like the husband because the husband doesn't have an option to say, I'm not supporting you. So therefore, you know, any lost item a woman finds goes to her husband. Now here, why does it go to herself? Because the orphans aren't functioning exactly like the husband. They're on a different track. They can actually say, no, take your chuba money instead. We're not going to support you. But if you say nizonet and not hanizonet, which is every woman should be supported, meaning they don't have a choice, they have a kabbal, then they should be just like her husband. Just like her lost item, uh, any item she finds goes to her husband. Likewise, it should go to the orphans, which means, and it doesn't. So it doesn't make sense to which, the, right? So therefore, it must be clear that this mission is referring to Anshay Yuda only if she gets supported, but not that they have to. To which they say, no, lo olam. Um, now they say, lo olam, ema. Nizonet none. They say, no, 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 it must be Nizonet. Okay, which is, um, one second. I just want to see one thing. I'm a, mm-hmm. something not right here. Um, right. Okay. So, what I failed to explain, which was an important point, which is that when Rabbi Zera said it in the name of Shmuel, he was referring to our Mishnah, that you can do, in, understand from our Mishnah that Masayada go to them, but not a mitzia. Okay? So that, that's not, it's important in understanding. Because he explains that from our Mishnah, therefore it would have to be talking about, right, again, we're going to assume they don't have to support her because if they did, they would be just like the husband and get any any items that she finds. 
But the Gemara says, no, no, no. Don't have to understand that even from Shmuel. No, you have to explain. If they're just like the husband and they have to support her and they don't have a choice, then why don't they get her lost items? Well, you have to go back to why does the husband get her lost items? Tama, my amur rabbana mitziati shalabala. Why did why does the mitzia go to the husband? eva. It's just so that she doesn't get cause animosity between them, so they don't start arguing. If the woman who's married to this man and he's been supporting her, and yes, she gives her the salary, but one day she shows up with this huge amount of money and he doesn't know where it comes from, you can imagine that would create some tension in the marriage. Whereas when it comes to orphans, it's more like they have a business deal. She gives him the salary and they give her food and or really they give her food. And if she has salary, she gives them salary. And that's it. There's not going to be any sort of, like the Bukumar says, honey, they're not going to get angry with her just because she finds some item on the street. So the Mitzia has absolutely nothing to do with whether they support her or not, in which case you could explain the Mishnah either as honey's on it or knees on it. Again, we're trying to get to the relationship between the woman and the orphans. So all the work, the job she has to do to her husband, remember the whole mission with, if she brings in a maidservant, she can take some of the jobs off her hands, but maybe all of them, maybe not all of them. Anyway, all the jobs she's supposed to do for her husband, she has to also provide for the children. Chutz me, right, which again, not necessarily her children. It's all the people who inherit the husband. Chutz me, and that's because also she's also getting supported by them. She's part of their household. Chutz me, other than, if you remember, there were ones that were that were uh, reflective of intimacy between the couple. So mizigata kos, which again was harder for us to understand why it's an intimate act. That's making the the um, the wine. They would pour water into the wine. They would take a concentrate of wine and add water to it. That was considered a more intimate act. Hatsa making the beds, setting up the beds, harchatsat panav yadavaraglav, and washing his hands, feet, and uh, face. Those she doesn't have to do for them because those are intimate things that are, show love between the couple, not relevant for the children. We're already talking about jobs. It's totally non sequitur. If it's something that an Evid Knani normally does for his master, a Canaanite slave, the Talmud also does for his rabbi, okay? A uh, Talmud, a student should serve their rabbi like a servant does. Chutz mi hatarat minal, other than taking off his shoe. Why is that? Because taking off his shoe was something unique that only slaves did. And therefore, if you did it, what was the concern? Concern is people are going to think you're a slave. If they're going to think you're a slave, you might remember this. Then they might marry you off to someone right? Or they won't marry you. This is the opposite, right? We had it before that they shouldn't stand on the line to get the food for the Kohanim. People will think they're Kohanim when it turns out they have no Yehus at all, right? Canaanite slaves cannot marry Jews. So here the concern is people will think you're a Canaanite slave. They won't let you get married. They'll put you on a blacklist. You definitely don't want to be there. So now Rava and others come up with all sorts of limitations with this because there's all sorts of ways that we could know that you're not a slave. Just because you put on your shoes doesn't mean we're going to assume you're a slave. We have other reasons to believe you're not a slave. Well, then you don't have to work. So it's only if you live in a place where nobody knows who you are. But if you're in a place everybody knows who you are and that you're the child of these people and they're Jews, then you don't have to work, right? Then late Lamba, then there's no concern. And even if they don't know you, we also don't say, if you don't put on tefillin every day. That's a big sign that you're Jewish. No non-Jews are putting on tefillin every day. And again, we don't have a concern. And already in this vein, we're now going to tell you that if you're the rabbi and you don't allow your students to, to do things for you, to serve you, it's like you're preventing chesed from coming upon these, these people. In other words, it's good for you. You might, if you're an important person, you don't really like when people do things for you, but it's actually a positive thing because you're allowing people to do chesed. Otherwise, you're preventing them from doing chesed. As it says in a pasuk in Eil, lamas mere'eu chesed. Lamas from the of yimas. Again, there's debate about what exactly the language is here, but some people say it's from melting. Like it will melt away from your friend. You'll melt away chesed. That will be preventing him from doing chesed. Rav Nachman bar Yitzchak Omer, af porek mimenu yirat shamayim. You're even causing him not to be a God-fearing person. 
That's even more severe. Shenemar, because the end of that pasuk says, he will leave the fear of God. Because again, serving to Chachamim helps develop in them a concept of Yerat Shamayim, because the rabbi is re- kind of representative of God in this world. So you should actually let your students um, serve you. Amar Rabbi Elazar, Almanasha Tafsam Taltalim Bimizonota, a new topic. Again, connecting with this Almana and Yitomim, the whole topic today will be that. But let's go back for one minute. If you remember, we've learned a number of times already that women can only accept their ketuba and their mazonot money can only collect them from land. The Gaonim changed this, because a lot of people didn't own land, and said even from movable items. But in the time of the Gemara, no, movable items was not an option. One difference between mazonot and metaltalin is that mazonot can only be collected, we've also learned this, since there's no end to the mazonot, there's no set amount, and some people could eat a real lot and it could eat for years, some people for less. So it's not connected with lien property. You can only take it from property that's not lien. So if they sell property and they have no more property left, you can't take from a tal to lien, okay? But if you if it's tuba money, then you can take from a tal to, then I'm sorry, then you can take from land that they sold, okay? In other words, if, I, I said it wrong. I mean, it's also true. You can't take from a tal to lien. What I meant to say is, if it's from a zono, you can't take it from land that they sold. And then you're also stuck because you can't take it from a taltalin. If it's for the ketuba, you're allowed to take it from lien property because anyone who buys the property knows that there's a lien on the property. Whereas with Mizono, they don't know how much money you could be, you can need, to, right? When I buy land, I check out, do you have any debts? So if I know you have a debt of X amount, so I buy it knowing that. If I know you have an infinite amount, like we don't know, or we have no idea how long you're going to have to pay Mizono to your wife, well, then it's hard for me to buy that land because I don't know whether you're going to, you know, how much I kind of make an assessment. Is it worth it to me or not? Is there a chance it's going to be collected or not? And I don't know what the amount is. I can't be expected to know that. And therefore, it, the law is you can't collect from lien property. So, even though you're not allowed to take, what if she took metaltalin for her mizonot? Anyway, it's effective. So you're not supposed to collect, but if you do, it's effective. Tanya Mihachi, bright to support Rabbi Elazar says, exactly the same thing. Okay, it's valid. She took a satchel full of coins. The rabbis did not have the power to remove it from her. All these show that they could take movable property. In other words, they shouldn't. If they did, it's effective. Ama Ravina. Ravina now comes and says, but pay close attention. Lo Amaran Ela Lemizoni. It's only for food. Why? Because when it comes to food, the, the Yutomim can actually dupe her. What can they do? They don't want to pay her food. They'll sell all the land. Once they sell it, she can't collect from that land. And now they have all movable property. And then they'll say, oh, just movable property. We can't. So that's why if she actually takes it from them, it's effective. Avalik Tuba. But since the ketuba money, she can always get, they can't sell it and say, well, now you can't collect it, right? We don't owe you anything. She can collect from the property they sold. And yeah, what would happen then? The person who bought it would then go demand it back from the orphans. So it doesn't help them very much. So the ketuba mafkina mina. Therefore, she doesn't have a right at all to take from a talti. Matkafa Marbaravashi. Marbaravashi actually disagrees with the logic I just explained about distinguishing the logic according to Ravina. He says, Ketuba and Mizonot are really one and the same because he doesn't really care about the Meshuabad, not Meshuabad. He said, look, you're not allowed to collect from a Taltali, only land, not movables. And yet when it comes to Mizono, if you did, it's valid. So if it comes to Ketuba also, it must be valid. And I don't see any reason to distinguish. So if it works for Mizono, it's effective. It should be effective for Tuba as well. Amalei Rav Yitzchak Bar Naftali the Ravina, okay, now going back to Ravina, who said only Mizono, so Rav Yitzchak Bar Naftali says to him, by the way, they say in the name of Rav, just like you. Amal Rav Yachana Mishmei the Rav Yossi ben Zimra. Al Manash Shata, Shtayim V'Shalosh Shanim V'Lo Tava Mizonot. If you have a widow who waited two or three years and didn't claim a Mizonot, you might remember we talked about this with land. If I don't, if you live on my land, property for three years and I don't say anything and you don't have a star to prove that you bought it, 
you can go to court and say, listen, I've been living here for three years and Michelle hasn't complained and you can prove Chazaka of three years. So now they say, this is also kind of creating Chazaka, although it says two or three years, which we're going to have to figure out why, that if she doesn't de demand Mizonot at all, and then two or three years pass, and then she comes and says, I want Mizonot, so Ibda Mizonot, she loses her Mizonot. The end of this, we're going to see that we mean if she tries to demand the two or three years back, she can't get them. Going forward, she can. I was going to say this, and the assumption is probably they mean this. Probably everyone agrees with that, although maybe not. But she basically loses her chance at least to get the Mizono that she didn't ask for all those years. Okay, so if after two years you lose your rights to demand them back, or of course three years, so you don't need to say two or three, you could just say two. So low cost, depends whether you're poor or rich. If you're poor, two years is a lot of time. And if you didn't care after two years, we assume you really don't care. But if you're wealthy, you don't really need the money, then you weren't desperate to get your money. So when you go to demand it later, you still get it because the, the two years passing is not indicative that you didn't really plan to ever collect it. Or inami, a different response, kamba prutsa, kamba tsnu. Prutsi, or it doesn't mean the usual meaning of prutsa. It means someone who's aggressive versus someone who's more introverted. So if you're introverted, you might not want to go to court and start demanding things from the court. So you might push it off, push it off, push it off until you feel you finally get to doing it, and then we'll give you three years. But if you're very assertive, then we're going to assume if two years pass and you didn't demand your money, you're definitely not demanding. This is all retroactively, meaning, so I said before, if there's two or three years pass and then you want to go back and get all that money, you can. But from here on in, you can still demand your Mizono. You're deserving a Mizono. You don't lose your rights because time passed. You just lose your rights to the, those past years. By Rabbi Yochanan, this is the question that's going to deal with for the rest of today. Rabbi Yochanan asked the following question. The Yitomim said, we already paid you your Mizono. And she says, right, let's say for the year. And she says, I didn't get my Mizono. Who is considered that they own the food? Okay, is it the Yitomim? Because the property is in their hands, right? Therefore, it's theirs. So she has to prove she really didn't get paid. Or is it hers? Because we've learned this many times. It's a tznaik tuba. It's one of her basic rights. So it's as if it's in her hands, which means that she's considered muhzak, which means that the burden of proof lies on the orphans. So what do we say? Do we say, here are the two sides, now on Amu Bed. Right, right? Uh, sorry, nichse. Are the, are the possessions in the hands of the Yatomi. And therefore, she has to bring a proof. Or do we view it as if it's in her hands? And then they have to bring a proof. Let's learn from here. Levi brings a bright time. As an almana, for as long as she doesn't yet get remarried, the Yitomim have to prove. The burden of proof lies on them. She's deserving of that money, and therefore it's as if it's in her hands. Niseit, only once she gets remarried. At this point, when she gets remarried, she loses her rights to Mizono. But let's say she wants to demand back pay. I didn't get my Mizono the last year, but she's already married. As soon as she's married, she loses her chazaka on the property. She no longer has rights to it, even though she has rights to what was. But then she would have to bring the proof that she never got paid. So you see here that in the basic case, it's she who's considered the owner and the Yatomim would have to bring the proof. That's a nice answer. But Rav Shimi Barashi comes and says, I'm Rav Shimi Barashi, Kitanai, it's actually a cloak This can be found in the following Tosefta. She, if she sells land of the husbands in order to get paid for a Mizono or for her Ketuba, she needs to write down, I sold this property to get my food payments, or I sold this property to get my ketubah payments. Divri Rabbi Yehuda. We don't yet know why. We're going to see why in a minute. Rabbi Yossi Omeo, and we're going to have three explanations to this machloket. The first one is that it's based on this exact machloket. Is she muchzak or are they muchzakim? Rabbi Yossi Omeo, mocheret v'kotevet stam v'chen kochayafe. She actually writes down, I sold these without specifying what she sold them for. And that makes, puts her in a more powerful position. So what does this mean? 
מה אליו בא כמפגן? לרבי יהודה דאמר בא אל הפירוש, right, she has to specify why, סבר נכסי בחזקת יד מקיימי, because we're assuming the property is in the possession of the orphans, ועל האלמנה להביא ראיה, and she has to bring proof, let's say she goes to demand her ketubah, so they say, but you sold property, so she'll say, she'll pull out what she wrote and say, well I sold property, that was for my food sustenance, I didn't get my ketubah payment, And therefore, what do you see here? It's all the burden of proof is on her to prove it. So that means they're the ones considered owners of the property. And that's what Rabbi Yehuda makes them write it. Rabbi Yosef Savar lo ba'i l'perushin. Nechse b'chezkai alman akaymei v'ali yitomim la'vi raya. And what does he say? That's why he said, that's kocha yafa. She's the one in power here. So she doesn't have to write anything down because the burden of proof is on them. They have to prove it, not her. So she doesn't need to write anything down. To which the Gemara says, Mimai, how do you know that's the Machlok? Dilma, dekulei alma, nechzei b'chazkat alma anakayme. Maybe, really, she's the one who owns the property. Vala yitomim la viraya. Everyone agrees, it's her who owns it. And then you have to explain Rabbi Yehuda differently. Rabbi Yehuda, eitza tova kamash malam. They're just giving her some good advice for a different reason. If she doesn't write it down, what might happen? Someone might come along and see she sold a lot of property of the husband. And think that she sold it for food. And think, so they're going to say, this woman is gluttonous. What's the relevance? Well, she's in the, in the scene now to go get married. People will say, I don't want to marry that woman. She's going to eat away at all my property because she's a big eater. Look how much she sold. So they're basically saying to the woman, be smart, Rabbi Yehuda says, and write it down so that people don't think that you're a gluttonous woman and you're selling all this property for the purposes of eating. Now, why is this a good proof? We're going to assume that this is right. Because if not, Rabbi Yochanan's question was, who's considered muhzak in the land, right? And we brought this machlok at Rabbi Yudah and Rabbi Yossi, trying to say maybe that's the debate between them, in the Tosefta. But if that's the debate between them and not this issue right now that we're saying about just looking like a Rav Tanuta and it's just good advice, well, in the Mishnah, on Tzadi Zayin Amabet, tomorrow's daf, It says the moche, right? Rabbi Yochanan could have gotten an answer from the simple opinion in our Mishnah that doesn't come with a machloket like it did in the Tosef. What does it say in the Mishnah? Mocheret lemizanot shelo bebetim vekotevet elu lemizanot macharti. Ella, right? Now, the assumption is the Mishnah holds like Rabbi Yehuda. She should write down that I sold them for the food. So now, right, if she didn't do it in the court, then when she sells The property, she has to say, I did it for food. And now, if you say that Rabbi Yehuda is basically saying she has to write it down because otherwise she's going right, to have to prove it. And really the Yatomim, well, then Rabbi Yochanan should have proven it from our Mishnah. And Rabbi Yochanan in general follows Stam Mishnah. So therefore, it must be that you really can't derive it from the Mishnah. Otherwise, Rabbi Yochanan would have to eat And that's because it's really just eat It's just giving good advice. having to do with her not looking like gluttonous, but not having to do with anything else. And therefore, Achanami, you can say the same thing by Rabbi Yehuda in the Tosefta, which seems to be matching the opinion in the Mishnah, that it's just Eitzat Tova, and therefore the Machloka between them has nothing to do with who is, right, who is the one um, who is considered the owner of the property, and who, on who lies the burden of proof. Inami, third explanation. We have basically three explanations of this Machloka in the Tosefta, One is, is it the Almana or the orphans who have Chazaka in the land? Two is, everyone agrees it's the widow who has the Chazaka. It's just we're telling her not to do this for a different reason. Three is, three is the other option. They all agree that it's the orphans who have rights to it. Now you have to explain Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yehuda makes sense because the Chazakat may write it down so that you can prove to the Yatomim what you took it for. But Rabbi Yossi, who says you don't have to write it down, is basically saying better not to write it down for your own sake. Why? To what is this similar? The guy's sitting on his deathbed and he says, give 200 shekel as a gift to this guy who, owes, who I owe money to. Now, the children, when they go to pay it off, oh, I'm sorry, when the, when the creditor goes to get this 200 shekel of a gift. He could decide, I'm taking this in place of my loan. 
Now, they give him 200 sous from the father because the father said, give him 200 sous. Now, he's owed 400 sous, okay? Because he's owed 200 as, a, as the loan the father took and he's owed 200 for this gift. So if he wants to take them as a gift, he can. If he wants to take them as a loan, he can. So now, why would he do one or the other? In other words, if you leave it open, you're better off. Why? Does it not make it better for him? Why? If he takes the first 200 sous they give them, they give him as a gift, then he's still left with his chov, with what he's owed. Now, a chov, you can demand from lean property. You can't demand a gift from lean property. So therefore, it's in his best interest to leave it ambiguous so he could claim later, oh yeah, I just got this for a gift and you still owe me the money from the loan. Likewise, the woman, if she leaves it open, then she can always say later, oh, that was my mezono, I'm still owed my ketuba. And then her ketuba, she can demand from nechassim shuabadim, from lean property, which she can't with her mezono. Go back to an issue discussed earlier. And that's what Rabbi Yossi says, she should leave it and not write down what it's for to allow her more fluidity with how she could collect it and what she could claim it was collected for. So now, just to review, so the last part of what we did today on the second side of the page was Rabbi Yochanan had this question, who's muhzak? We answered it from this Braita that she's the one who's muhzaket, right? Because as so long as she's not married. And then we tried to say, maybe there's a machloka tana'im and we brought the Tosefta and then we read the Tosefta in three different ways, right? Not one way and then two more ways which then showed, two of the ways showed this has nothing to do with this issue, and either they all agree she is mochzeket, or maybe they all agree that they're mochzeket. With that, we will end for today. Wishing everyone a chag sameach and mo'adim l'simcha.